When I was first introduced to the art of kintsugi, I really didn't understand how it was going to impact me. It almost seemed silly to participate in a craft and try and compare it to a survivor and their journey. The second my hammer hit the bowl, I was shocked at how I instantly connected with the bowl. It was laying shattered in pieces in front of me, broken. It was lifeless. It used to serve a purpose, but it now couldn't. Some would say it was even useless. What I learned is that sometimes all it takes are the proper tools to repair something. The truth is, I still have value. I am stronger than I was before. No matter what happened in my past, I know that I have a bright future. Sometimes all it takes is patience in the process. Learning how to properly heal has helped me see that I can celebrate my scars. I am not a victim. I am a survivor. Kintsugi isn't about fixing a bowl. Kintsugi is about understanding the importance of healing properly. That if I'm patient with myself, if I use the proper tools, and if I take the time to tend to my wounds, I can become even more beautiful. The once sharp shards of broken pottery have now become way more valuable than it was before. It now has a story of victory that can be celebrated and can be displayed proudly. And so do I. Well, as we uh, kind of wrap things up in this sermon series, I think uh, there's, there's a lot that is going on as we think about brokenness in the world. And uh, obviously, I'm a broken person. I deal with sin just like the rest of us. And I deal with healing that God uh, has graciously poured over me. And I have this other thing, a physical issue that's going on. And I, I'm going to use that a little bit today to think about um, this idea that I have this weird spot in my arm that all of a sudden decided it wanted to act up and hurt. And you kind of go, well, where'd that come from? And I know I've got a few less years on my belt than some of you and a few more than others. And some of you who have more wisdom than me will say, wait, do you get another 20 years down the road, right? And you're like, this is serious business. Like these bodies are not meant to last. But I'm dealing with this uh, in, a, in an interesting way, like I normally do. I don't want to go to the doctor. I just don't. I don't want to pay the bills. I don't want to go and have them say, yeah, it's broken and it has a problem. Or worse yet, I don't want to have to have any kind of surgery. I just don't want to do that. I kind of just want it to get better, right? Just, I'm just hoping it'll just get better. And we're going to kind of talk through that in this idea that really, if we really want true healing uh, from God and, and really to recover from brokenness, uh, we have to be more vigilant and more diligent than that. So uh, we started our sermon series with a really important concept. The first idea is that as I hold God's word in my hand, we believe that this is 100% truth. And if you're not sure about that, then you've got to wrestle with that for yourself. In fact, the first word, I think, God in his just amazing wisdom, he starts with a sentence. In the beginning, God created. And most people close it there and go, I'm not sure I can handle this because I don't agree with that because of what I'm hearing or what I'm thinking. But I'm here to tell you that's how, where we started in this sermon series, that there's been a, a broken view of God's creation. See, his desire was that we would be in relationship with him. We see in, the, in Genesis as Adam and Eve get to walk in the cool of the garden with their creator. What a cool picture. Someday we'll get that. Someday. If we're a follower of Christ and we've surrendered our life, we get to do that. But right now we don't. And what happened was 
sin entered the world and shattered a relationship with humanity and God. Because of his holiness, we could not be in his presence. And we're left with the fallout, broken relationships, broken marriages, broken views of sexuality, broken perceptions and perspectives on God and his plan for humanity and his love for us. And it gets twisted and distorted. And so what we're talking about is this idea that that God is a God who wants to heal and restore. He wants to take what was your sin and wash it away because he has a purpose and a plan for you. And so that's what we're going to go through. And so my hope for today is that we will close a sermon series with an idea that we want to see you go from broken to beautiful. That the choices you've made, the sin you've had, or sins that have been done to you, have been washed and you're a new creation with a purpose. That we're not to wallow in our brokenness and keep pointing out all the brokenness. We're to say, there's healing that comes out. And what do we do with it? And so we're going to look at that. And we're going to start in 2 Kings with two pretty important characters you need to know in the story. And the first one is Elisha. Now, he was a prophet of God. This is around 800 BC. And uh, he was given power from God to work through him to heal people. In fact, he was most noted as the uh, prophet of peace, the prophet of healing and restoration. What a cool picture for what we're talking about. This guy was blessed to be a blessing. And through him, God did many things. And then there's Naaman, and we'll see that he was a commander of the Syrian army. So so Naaman is is a big-time, big-shot leader. Um, But Naaman has a problem here. He has a disease called leprosy. And leprosy, of course, is a skin disease that eventually will begin to eat away at fingers and toes. And if you're a soldier and you have no fingers, your ability to fight is gone. Your role that youth were called to diminishes. But something cool is going to happen in our story. And so it begins with the reality that as Naaman came back from a battle one time, he ended up taking captives. And one of those captives was a young girl that lived in his home and served him basically as a servant, as a slave, however you want to look at it. And she, however, didn't do what I would do. Look at what she did. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who's in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Why is that surprising? Because if I were held captive, taken from my homeland in the house of the the person who took me, I think I would wring my hands in joy as I watched his body deteriorating. I think the way I'm built, I would want to see that person punished and his leprosy would be a great tool for that. And I would just go right on. That means my role here may be shortened if he gets worse and worse. But she doesn't do that. You see, she's a believer in God, and she has compassion on him. And she shares this story, and he hears about it, and of course, he gets super excited. And as he gets excited, he goes to the king of Syria, and he says, hey, here's what's going on. I can get healed. And the king is like, that's fantastic news, because you're like one of my best warriors. I'm super excited that you're not going to be disease-ridden anymore. So he writes a letter, and he says, go see the king of Israel. But where did she say to go? She said, go see the prophet Well, I think they had another idea. Naaman loads up all of his gear, including multiple chariots with servants, lots of gold, lots of silver, clothing, and gifts. And he heads off to the king of Israel. So he arrives and hands the king the letter, and the king responds this way. He reads the letter, and then he tears his robe and says, Am I God? Why are you coming to me? He says, can I kill and bring back to life? Like, why are you coming to me? First, I'm concerned because I know who you are. Are you here to create a tension? Are you here to maybe work your way in and destroy what I built as the king here? Or maybe he's like, you're just loony. Why are you here? This is not me. Why did you do this? I see all your gifts. Well, he ends up telling him, uh, you know, I'm pretty upset right now. But see, Elisha hears about it, and Elisha goes to the king, and he's, it's kind of cool. He's like, well, what's your problem? Just tell him to come see me. So Naaman does. He heads off, and he's outside Elisha's house, and I can picture it. He's got all of his chariots. He's got his servants. He's got his money, and he's like, hey, come tell me. 
Tell me what it is. Come and heal me. I'm ready. I'm here. I heard that you're the guy. And here's what happens. Elisha sends a messenger to him. Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you'll be cleansed. It sounds great, but we have a problem. It says that Naaman gets really angry. In fact, he goes on to say, what's so special about the Jordan? I have rivers that are far better back in Damascus where I come from. What's the big deal? So he's angry and he leaves. We're going to talk about why that is true in a minute. But he leaves and then his servants as gracious as they are, they say, hey, you know, he only asked you to go get in the river. What if he asked you to do something really amazing, really like powerful to show how amazing you are? You would have done that. And all he said was, go dip in the the river. Well, he does follow through with it. And we'll see in our story that in fact, he does come to faith. I'm sorry, he comes to healing. (laughs) which then he comes to faith in the God, the creator. But here's the thing. We're going to look at our story because it's important that we understand leprosy in the Old Testament first. You see, this disease is often referred to as a comparison to sin. Its attributes are very similar. The first thing that leprosy does is it drives you out of relationship with people. You see, there was great fear about catching this disease. They, they figured it's highly contagious. So if you had leprosy, you either had to live out of the camp usually or outside the walls somewhere, and you had to be very secluded. And like sin, it separates us from God. It keeps our relationship from being connected. Leprosy wasn't cured until 1940, aside, of course, from what God would do in our story and in other places. But there wasn't a cure until 1940 when the first vaccine was presented. Sin was cured when Jesus went on the cross and defeated death and rose again. The cure was there. But see, the problem is, like leprosy, sin is painful. It's destructive. Like leprosy, sin deforms us. It twists our thinking. It messes with how we see God and and how we relate to others. And then finally, sin destroys us eventually. If you live with leprosy long enough, it will destroy you. And the same is true with sin. And not dealt with appropriately, it will separate you from eternity from God, though. And yet, the best cure came. So we have an issue that has to be dealt with. And I'll tell you, I I was in the Hawaiian Islands uh, for some years, and I spent nine months on Molokai, and on that island, there is a, a leper colony. And when I was there in the 90s, there was still uh, lepers living in that colony. And I think, what a, a beautiful place, and what a sad place, because they couldn't leave that little peninsula. That was their life. They were confined there. And I think, how sad. So what does it look like if we want to be healed in our life, if we want God to do a mighty work in us, if we want to go from broken to beautiful... If Naaman is going to be gone from leprous to cleansed, what does that take? And the first thing I want to bring out today is that humility is a step in healing. And I would say it is the first step. It's required for us if we're going to experience healing from brokenness. Look at what happens in the story. We're going to look at Naaman again. Uh, It says here that Elisha, remember, he sent a messenger to him. Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you'll be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry. There's not a lot of humility going on in this moment. You see, think about him arriving with chariots of of gold and silver and fine clothing with a title and a chip on his shoulder. See, his pride got in the way. Why is he angry? Because Elisha didn't come talk to him directly. Certainly, if you knew who I was, you would have just come down. But you just send a messenger? I mean, come on. Come on. His pride gets in the way. And I wonder how many times in your life your pride gets in the way. You see, in this scenario, Naaman refuses to commit to God's plan. He won't humble himself to his plan. His plan is, go get wet in the river. And I'm not even going to send Elisha. I'm going to send a messenger to do that. Kind of like I get to be your messenger today. 
Second thing is that he's indifferent to the plan. He, I believe that he had a different plan. I believe that Naaman's plan was go see the king, present a bunch of gifts, and pay for his healing. I think that was his plan. And he's not too humble when his plan isn't going the way he wanted. And then finally, his financial strategy could not pay for what he desired. And the same is true for you and me. We cannot buy our way into heaven. We cannot spend enough money, give enough of ourselves, say enough nice things or help enough people across the street. None of it matters. It's all filthy rags. It's only a full surrender to Christ. To humble yourself to say this is important. Through the prophet Isaiah, the Lord says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and your thoughts, excuse me, and my thoughts than your thoughts. See, it doesn't make sense. Why do I have to humble myself? Why do I have to come before you, God, and say that I'm a mess? I don't want to do that. I don't like that way. And he says, but that's the way. And I made it real simple. There's one way. And my ways are going to not, you're not going to understand all my ways. You're not going to understand my thoughts. First Peter says this, all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. If we're not willing to be humble, how can we expect God to work in us? I've uh, counseled a fair number of people in my life, uh, not only as a pastor, but in the school systems. And I'll tell you, when people come into a room who are in conflict, the couples, the f- whatever relationship is going on, the greatest success you can tell right off the bat, whether it will be good or not, will be on the level of humility that each people bring to the table. If one's unwilling to be humble, it's going to be tough. If both are rigid, (laughs) good luck. But if people will come together in humility, then you will see healing begin to happen. And the same is true for us. The second step, though, in that is surrender. See, we we humble ourselves to the idea that, wow, your ways aren't my ways. Okay, God, uh, apparently I can't earn myself here. I can't pay for my salvation. I can't pay for this cleansing of my leprosy. So now I have to surrender to your plan. And you see, Naaman almost lost his healing because he went away angry. You see, God sent a young girl first a girl to tell of how the healing could come. Praise God that he did that. And number two, he then gives him these servants. And look at how the servants approach him. He says this, Naaman's servants went to him and said, my father. So first of all, a term of endearment to say, this isn't a biological thing here. This is, you know, I'm going to submit to you because you're mighty. So I'm going to give you lots of honor. My father, he says, If the prophets had told you to do something great, a great thing, would you not have done it? Like, you're a super powerful guy. You could have done anything. And yet all he said was this, go be washed. He says, how much more than this? Like, that's it. Like, you would do whatever it took if he said, do something mighty. And all he says is, just go humble yourself and follow and surrender to this strategy, this idea. Go to the river and dunk yourself seven times. What's the big deal? Are you open to the gospel then is my question. Are you open to what God wants to do? He says, all you have to do is come before me, all you who are weary. Just come before me. Surrender to what I have for you. Humble yourselves to acknowledge that you can't do it yourself, and now surrender to me and watch what I can do. And I think we see this in Proverbs when it says, trust the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. I want you to circle this word all if you have your Bible there and you're a circler. It says, in all your ways, submit to him and he'll make your path straight. You see, we get on God's path and it's this beautiful straight road and then off the side are these things that we keep wanting to do. And he says, I can't bless those things. Stay on my path. He says, all of them. 
And, you know, for those of you who are parents or grandparents or will be parents someday, or for you who are children, you have parents perhaps who have some wisdom that you could learn about paths. As I raise my boys now as getting ready and one's off to college here, I see that if only that he would listen to some of the wisdom of the paths that I can see him going down. Like I see the destruction and I'm just a human. Imagine God's view. But I can see it like, you know, that thing you're wanting to do, it's not the best choice. Sometimes we don't want to listen. So trusting the Lord through this process is important. But the third step, I think, is the hardest for all of us, quite honestly. You see, this is a continual process. We have to humble ourselves every day. And then we have to surrender every day. But here's the big one. That only happens when we have commitment. So I talked about my elbow, and I was thinking, this is a pretty good scale to measure your commitment. So for me right now with an elbow, how committed am I to getting this thing fixed? How committed? Well, be honest with you, I really wish it would happen. I kind of just want it to happen. I really don't want to do anything. I don't want to see anybody. I just want to wake up and, hey, whew, awesome, and there it is. Now, God can heal if he chooses, and I am praying for that, and I had somebody pray for me last service. I thank him for that, and I'm praying that it will be healed. But me personally, I'm so committed, I'm at the wish phase, right? Does that sound very committed, <laughs> right? So in your marriage, are you wishing the marriage would be better, or are you committed to making it happen? As you work out your faith with Christ and, and what God wants to do through you, are you wishing that you'd have this deeper relationship or are you committed? And you want it so bad you'll, you'll get up a little early or stay up a little late or watch one less TV marathon, right? Those things suck me in, these Netflix vortex of I want to see the end and now it's not just an hour movie right? It's a 13-day series. <laughs> I'm committed, though. How committed am I? Am I really into it? And so when I go through this, I think you have to know that I know what the cycle looks like. And I'm going to tell you about the parent cycle, because I think the parent cycle goes like this. When I was a teacher, Carl didn't do his homework. Well, at least I thought. And then midterms came out and he's failing the class. And the parents call, frantic. What's going on with Carl? He does his homework every night at home. We do it with him. And I say he hasn't turned any in. Oh, my goodness. Can we have a meeting? You bet. So here we are. We're ready to get committed. So parents come in. Carl comes in. And we say, where's your homework? He says, I don't know. He says, well, go get your locker. So he goes and he unloads the locker to the table, a big pile. And guess what's in the pile? What is it? All the homework, every one of it done because the parents were diligent with him. They were committed to him, right? Is there anything we can do? How can we get Carl to turn it in? I said, I have a strategy if you'll be committed to it. Are you ready? Yeah, what is it? Okay, we have a planner. He signs it and hands me homework. I sign it. He brings it to you. You sign it so I know, you know, he knows what he did. <laughs> right? Does that make sense? Pretty simple. So here we go. First week, Monday works great. Carl comes up with homework, I sign, he takes it home to parents, they sign, and he signs. Tuesday, man, it, like clockwork. Wednesday's looking good. Thursday, no Carl. <laughs> right? Friday, no Carl. Monday, no parents, no Carl. Report card still failing. See, we wished, we were committed at the start, but then we had a problem. See what happened in our story? Naaman had to be committed. Look at what it says he had to do. He says he went down. Step one, he actually went. Then he dipped himself seven times. And imagine the story. What? It doesn't say this, but I could picture that he goes down perhaps and, and dip one, he comes up and his hands are clean. No more leprosy. And that feels good. And he's excited, so he backs out of the river, expecting that that will flow to the rest of his body. Could you imagine that? Because like us, we're really committed, and when we see the immediate little bit of result, we back off, and we go into coast mode. But see, that's not commitment. Commitment is until your last breath or until the Lord returns. That's commitment. 
And so what does he do? He goes in and seven times he does it. One, two, imagine the counting maybe even by the people around the river who are watching this in anticipation of what's about to happen. And number seven, he comes up fully cleansed fully clean. In fact, it says he was so clean, he became to the flesh to be like that of a young boy. The older I get, the drier my skin gets, the more I realize how blessed I was. Wow. I'd watch my dad put lotion on. I'm like, I hate lotion. And now I'm starting to see why it has its benefits, right? I can see that. It's not bad. But here's the thing that I want to walk through. If you're going to be committed to working out not only what God wants to do in you and to help heal the brokenness in your relationships, in your relationship with God and others, there's, I think, some steps we need to to do to show commitment. The first one is this, that I start with prayer and confession. When do I pray and confess? All the time. All the time. Am I committed to it? I have to be. It says in, uh, we're looking at 1 John, it says if we confess our sins that he is faithful. It says he'll forgive us and he will purify us from our unrighteousness. But I have to pray and I have to confess. And I don't like confessing. And I think, well, why do you make me do that, God? You already know my sin and you already said you forgave me. And I think he would look at you and say, because I want you to acknowledge that you're broken. I need you to acknowledge it. The second step in this would be to renew the mind. And we know the familiar verse from Romans that uh, not to be conformed by the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Get into God's word is what it's saying. Let this word permeate this heart so that you can know what his good, pleasing, and perfect will is for you. So he can take what the world wants to distort and reorient it so that it's clear in your mind that his word is truth. When do we do that? Every day, committed, continual, until the last breath. Or he returns, praying for that. Next we have maintaining focus. You see, here's where we run into the problem. This is where the commitment usually takes a hard left for some people. I maintain focus. It says in, the, in 1 Peter, be alert and sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls like a lion waiting to devour. See, this is our problem. We're committed. We're committed. But if we aren't maintaining focus, we go on cruise control. We might even be praying a little bit. And we might even be renewing our mind a little bit. We're not that committed. But what we do is we sit back. And the enemy is not effective when you're here faithfully and you're here faithfully and you're renewing your mind. But as soon as you take the back seat and you don't maintain focus, that's when he comes in. It's when you slumber and when you rest your mind and you just think, ah, it's just a week. I just haven't read for a week. It'll be okay. And then it's a month. And I just have, I'll pray. I know I need to pray. I know. And then it's, two months, and you know the vicious cycle that happens, and then he attacks, and then you're right back to brokenness, and the cycle repeats, right? Rinse, wash, repeat, like shampoo. It just keeps going. But we get to the last one, and this is, this is important. There's trust. Trusting the healer. I don't know about you, but uh, I have a pretty short attention span, and I think the faster our world goes, like, I go to the drive through I want my food now, and then my phone is slow, even though I bought it yesterday, it was brand new, but it's already slower than what it should have been, and the computer is, everything is, and here I am, and I say, but I, I, I don't want to trust you, God, but I'm not seeing results like right now, so therefore I'm going to go try my own thing for a little bit. No, I'm committed to you. I'm committed. I really am. But I'm not really trusting you that it takes longer than I want. And I think some of what he does is he delays to show our true commitment. It says that uh, in the Psalms there, Psalm 147, that he heals the brokenhearted and binds up the wounds. That's God's heart. We have seen through the sermon series how people have shared very openly the brokenness in their marriage. And you know what? These are many of the steps that they've had to do to find the healing they wanted. 
for those who have shared about their struggles and addiction and those who have shared about their, their view of God and their view of, the, of what God wants to do. See, they had to go back and humble themselves. And they had to surrender. And then they had to commit. And when we do that, we begin to see something new happen. And so that's what I want to finish up with today. What now? See, my goal was that we not just do a a sermon series where we look and and acknowledge that we're broken and not just acknowledge that we're full of sin and and that God came and found, uh, showed us, I'm sorry, showed us how to be healed and and how to have new life and be a new creation. But I want to focus on this idea that there's a thing called the new normal. See, I don't know about you, but normal for me is in opposition of what it says in Galatians. In Galatians, for those of you who are aware of this, we have this phrase, this idea, the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit's love and joy and peace and kindness and patience, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. See, those are not normal. What's normal for, well, I'll be honest for me then. I can't speak for you. But you know what's normal for me prior to Christ? Hate. That was just normal. That was easy. It's easy to hate. It's hard to love. You know what else is normal? Chaos, not peace. When the world is crashing to join the the crash train and then freak out, that was normal, right? Normal was not to be gentle. Normal was to be aggressive. But see, if we're truly experiencing the healing and brokenness, if we're truly following Christ, this is what new normal should be. It should be people who are compelled with love like that little girl who was loving God so much she would tell the very person who helped remove her from her culture, she told him about healing. That's a pretty compassionate heart. See, the new normal is patience. It takes time to get the healing accomplished. And so how does this play out realistically? Let's let's finish with this idea. Why does God want to heal you? Why does he want to restore you? Why does he want relationship with you? What's that all about? It all comes down to one simple idea. So that you would display the living, active God in your life so that the world could see the living and active God. See, they walk outside and they can't deny creation, although people want to. But they cannot deny what happened. Naaman went and was cleansed. And you got to know that first it says that he then said, wow, uh, this God is real. That's the only God I'll serve. But what was his witness? His was a visual witness, right? His skin was now clean. Perfect, back the way it was supposed to be of a young boy. His witness was on display. And that's the purpose of this. So let let me make it a little more personal. If this plate represented my life, I could start here with this golden weave right here. This would have been uh, fifth grade when my parents got divorced, and that plate of my life broke in half. And I'll tell you, it destroyed my view of marriage and what a relationship between a man and a woman was supposed to look like. And then as I grew up and and I I became a follower of Christ and he began to mend that, even in the first few years of my marriage, that was still broken. And God said, let me show you what it's supposed to look like. And and so my wife and I continue to work and, and God is at work in the middle. See, not all of these gold lines were good results or good outcomes. The fact is, Jesus said, look, I didn't come so you'll be happy and and be roses and flowers and balloons everywhere you go. He says, I'm telling you, it's going to be hard. The point is that when the gold comes in, it didn't mean the outcome was what you wanted, but it proves that I'm active because I'm going to help you move forward so you can tell the world that I am real. This is a pretty big one in my life here. This was at 15 years old. My stepbrother uh, grabbed a shotgun and put it to my mom's head one night. And then he cocked that gun. And I thought that was the last day I'd see my mom alive. And believe me, when that happened, praise God, that did not pull the trigger. Praise God that that she is still alive today. But I took this part of the plate and I held that. And I did not want God to touch it. And how hard is it for God to glue pieces together when I won't give them to him? It's hard. 
And for 15 years, I held rage and bitterness in me to the point where, not figuratively, literally, I wanted to kill him. He hurt me deeply. I was so angry at him. He did so much to our family. And it wasn't until 15 years later I was sitting up in that area of the church and and God said, you know, I really want to do some work through you, but you're going to have to do something. You're going to have to forgive him. I was like, I don't want to. I was like, well, it's going to be an ugly plate, (laughs) right? So I surrendered that and and this, this could represent that in my story. And I have a lot more of poor choices and things done to me. But the whole point of it is, today I can take my story and prove to others that God is real. And that is the purpose of healing. So that his name would have glory all around the globe. That you would lift up his name. Not look what I've done, but look at what God has done. Yeah, these were ugly lines and they were hideous and they were terrible things, but that's not who God is. This is, this is why he wants to heal. So your life can be on display. The world craves to know God is real. Your job is to show it. So let him heal you. Here's the challenge. Number one, and you may not be able to fill this out right now. I think you should perhaps take this today and think through this. But the first one is, where do you need more surrender? Where is that in your life? Where do you need to surrender more? It may be in a relationship with somebody, but ultimately, where do you need to surrender to God more? And the second piece is, I think, pretty obvious. Where do you need to commit more? Maybe it's Bible reading. Maybe it's prayer. Maybe it's uh, your generosity or your time, your giving of finances. Whatever it is, where do you need to commit more so that people can start to see God alive in you and you can start to share who God is. I want you to leave today knowing that brokenness is part of the process of healing. But healing is there so that you can share what God is doing in your life. So let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much. What a, what a joy to look at your word and to see how in a story like this where you would heal someone physically, And for some of us who maybe have experienced physical healing, God, we thank you. But for those who have surrendered their lives to you, God, I pray and I thank you. And we lift up your name for the glorious work of salvation that comes so freely from you. Thank you for all you do. We love you and we surrender our hearts to you today in your precious name. Amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video. And uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here and you're Uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person. And I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really. And so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me, or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging. And we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So if you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.